Hello, it's Duncan. In the last couple of episodes of Guild of Rose development, we've added catching exceptions and logging them. And then we converted those logs into structured events so that they could be parsed by an external system so that we could graph them and see whether our system was getting better or worse over time. Today, we'd like to extend some of that analytics work so that we can see how much our application is being used. If you were there, you'll remember we invented this analytics interface, which is just a type alias for a function that takes an analytic event and does something with it, but returns nothing. And we have a logging analytics, which writes that as JSON to system out. The actual catching of exceptions is done in main by a catch all filter, which logs an uncaught exception event to our analytics interface here. And we have some application level tests in this uncaught exceptions tests that actually fires up a copy of the app and shows that if we hit an error route, then we get this, an event added to our list of events. So this wouldn't be a bad place to add another test that shows that we log every request and response. So I think we're gonna rename this to application events tests and that will run all the tests because they run really rather quickly. There we go. So we can rename this to uncaught exceptions raise an event and let us move this fixture out as a field And if we do that, then we can inline this stop. This we don't really care about what the value of that is. And we can just inline those as well. So what do we want for every request? Let's duplicate this test. And we could say every request raises an event. So this time, instead of going to our error route, we'll go to our root route, the one that lists our stock. And instead of getting an internal server error, well, we expect to see a response OK. Um, and we don't know what the body will be because that will depend on the contents and the time and so on. So it would just be easier here, I think, to say that a response status should be OK. So we'll say response status is Okay, and at the moment there should be no events. So zero is our event size, say, because we haven't made any changes. Let's just check that works. And in these cases, probably we'll just run these tests for now it'll be a little bit quicker, give us better feedback. Okay, there we go. Now let's write the test for what we want to see, which is that the events, the first event should be some event type, and we might think that we might want an HTTP event. And interestingly, we are offered the ability to import that. So let's go and have a look and see what org HTTP events HTTP event is. Okay, so looking at this, we find that HTTP 4K has um, an event type itself, and this has incoming and outgoing variants, and some we're populating them with something called an HTTP transaction, which seems to know things about the request and response and duration, all of which would be really useful to us to log. So let's go and see if we can work out how HTTP 4K would like us to use that event. Actually, that took quite a bit of digging, um, including asking questions on their Slack channel. But that turned up this report HTTP transaction, which is a filter. And report HTTP transaction will give us an HTTP transaction, and it will inject it into a record function here. So this is designed to be used in our main, 
and added to our list of filters. So we might put in report HTTP transaction and then our catch-all and then the rest of our routes. Now this requires a function, that function from an HTTP transaction to unit. So let's give it something for now which will just print learn the HTTP transaction. Oh, and we need to tell it which one we're talking. So it turns out to be a bunch of these, so we are going to pass it record function. Okay, so let's just try running our tests and see what we get. And every request raises an event. Oh, well, that failed because we didn't raise an event, but you can see we did print something here. It printed the whole of the transaction. Okay, what can we do with that? Now, instead of just printing, we need to raise an analytics event. And that is going to take an HTTP event incoming, and it can build that on our HTTP transaction. We have a problem though. Our analytics here is a function from analytics event, whereas the HTTP event here is an HTTP 4K event, an HTTP 4K HTTP event, and the types aren't the same. So maybe we should just copy this class but make it our own event type. That seems like an expedient thing to do. So let's copy this and we'll go back to our main and we'll say we want to have our own class which we will call HTTP event. It's not an HTTP event like that. Uh, it is one of our analytics events. And we know that we like those to be data classes. Now, what do we want in our logs? Well, the URI would be handy, the method would be handy, the status would be handy, the latency. The URI template, I don't know about and I'm inclined to leave out. And this, I don't understand, I'm gonna get rid of. These want to be the values of our event. And we want a constructor based on the HTTP transaction, which is going to do, in fact, pretty much what that does. And we're a data class, so we don't need this two string. Now, why is that not building? Squirrely there, and we're done. And here then, back up here, we want to use our HTTP event on that. Right, back into our test, and we may remember that's the wrong HTTP event class. So let's just go and fix that up. This wants to be import our HTTP event. Okay, let's try running that. Excellent. Now the passing of the test shows that we are actually logging the right sort of event here. But when we actually look at the output, we see that there's a lot of structure in here. A URI is broken down into the scheme and user info and host and port, etc. All of which are making this quite a bit more complicated than it need to be. Also the status, you notice, has the code and the description and whether it's a client error. There's a whole bunch of HTTP4K gubbins in here that I don't suppose we want. But we can fix that by changing the types in our HTTP event here. So at the moment this is URI method status. And so if we change these all to strings, then we will be forced to and that to an int the code, then we will be forced to convert into a type that's better for our logs. So that will be the string, the method, we'll get its string version, and the status, we will get its code, which is an int. Let's try running that. And that's a lot nicer. So now your URIs are just the path, the method is just the string, and the status is just the int. While we're here though, we notice that there is this little plus sign and that actually we have logged three events in total. 
And thinking it through, because we put our filter on the outside of main here, this transaction is reporting the HTTP result from our catch-all filter. And that's good for us actually, because it means that we see both the uncaught exception and what we actually returned here as the second event. So let's go and actually assert that in our test so that we record that that desirable behavior is actually happening. So that's in here and we can say that our second exception is our HTTP event. And just to tidy this up, I think we will make these first, second event and first we will make the zeroth. Done that. Good. Do we need to check the internal details of these things? Um, we could, but certainly the latency is going to change depending on how long it took. Um, I think we'll probably look at this and decide that that is good enough. Here though, there could always be two events and we only really want there to be one. Now we could solve, tighten this up by saying that the size of our events is just one. But it'd be nicer, I think, to have instead of just events first, we could say events only. So if we had events only, we get rid of that, and then add ourselves a little extension on any collection. And this will say, if our size is not one, it should be an error. Otherwise, and this wants to return an E. Just check that does the job. This is untested, it's only in our test, but we can still tidy it up a little bit, convert it to expression body, and I think maybe a when looks nicer with expression bodies. So when the size is not one, it's an error, otherwise it's the first item. Right. Just before we go on, we'll put a little blank line in there just to separate out the before and the after. Same there. And back to main and just sort of tidy up this formatting, I think. So it would be nice if this thing was a function. This will be report HTTP transactions. And so we are saying our roots are report the HTTP transactions, then the analytics, and then our roots. Format that, and we need to join that. Now let's just check that everything runs. And it does, which is nice. So we will check that in, I think. Two warnings. Ah, left some stuff behind. Run the tests. Commit. And that's quite a bit better, I think. Before we finish today though, looking back at our logs, we know that there are two events here for the one request, but we have a problem tying them up together. We could look at the timestamps to see they were close together, but these are all close together and we don't know which ones are about the same request. So it'd be nice to have some way of threading together events that were connected, that were part of the same request. That way we could work out, oh, we got this stack trace and it was associated with this particular request and maybe there would be other logging, other events up and down inside the system that we could associate and see, oh, this went wrong because of this, this problem we have with some other system or whatever. Now, there's a system called Zipkin Tracing that is designed to do this for us. And HTTP4K comes with some support for Zipkin Tracing.
So let's see what we can find. Okay, a little bit of digging turns up request tracing, which is a server filter. And this, if we ignore these report functions here, basically sets a thread local of Zipkin traces that we can pull out in other places. And if we look here, we'll see that Zipkin traces has a trace ID, a span ID, and a parent span ID. And the idea is that these allow us to piece together the way that an execution path has gone. And also they allow us to do that across servers so that we might have a microservice where we had one HTTP request came into us and we dispatched it to other places and we would pass on these headers. We'd pass on the single trace ID and we might create a span ID that was associated with our parent span ID and so on so that tools can produce call graphs across distributed services. Now we don't need much of that, but let's take what we can and so we will go to request tracing and add the request tracing to our main routes. So that is request tracing, then report the transactions. And that wants to be on the outside because we want the thread local with the traces set up for everything inside our application. Reformat that, import, and just import that as well. Okay, let's run all our tests, see whether that breaks anything. And it does. Let's see what it breaks. So it breaks our tests, and what it changes here is that our actual response has these trace ID headers in it. And so that has been what our Zipkin request tracing added to our outgoing response. That's a good thing for us, but it does mean that we have to look at how to test when we don't know what responses, what headers are going to be added to our response. And the first thing we can do is split this up into two different asserts, one on the status and one on the body so that we just ignore the headers. So let's just duplicate this. And the first one will be that our responses status is internal server error. And the second will be that our responses body will be how something went wrong. So let's run that. Okay, that passes. There is a nicer formulation of that though, and it involves composing assertions. Now, HTTP 4K comes with support for a library called Hamcrest. And if we bring that in for testing, that will allow us to write assert to that, our response, and we have some matches like has status. And we can pass that internal server error. Import the right version. And then we could assert that the response has body. Giving it this here. Run that. So those equivalent of the two assertions we have here but we can compose them so that we can say response has status internal server area and has body. Run that. And if one of those things is wrong, then Hamcrest will give us nice diagnostics. So you see here, we expected a value that has status that is equal to 500 and has a body, but the body was something went wrong, sorry, 
So Hamcrest allows us to loosen our expectations of our response, but still have a convenient syntax to check multiple things at once. So we've seen that the filter, the request tracing, added some headers to our response. They could be used by an upstream system or our client, but we also want to make use of them in our tracing. So let's now go to our analytics and this logging analytics. And at the point where we are actually doing the logging, we could look at our zipkin traces and we can find them for the current thread. Now what are we going to do with them? Well, we could add the bits we want to the envelope. So let's just try that. Let's have val traces at zipkin traces. Now bear in mind that this coupled our analytics to HTTP4K, which we might not want, but at the moment I think um, I'm not very unhappy with that. Let's pull our envelope out here and we can pass our traces into here. Okay, let's just see what sort of things we get out. So first of all, we have a failure in one of our tests. Let's see which one, ah, it's the one that checks what JSON we're actually outputting, which is um, good for us. So you can see here that we were expecting just a timestamp in the event, but now we're seeing traces with a trace ID and a span ID and so on. Now this is maybe again a little bit too much structure for us. Uh, what we'd like to see would just be the trace ID and the span ID in the top level of our envelope. So let's go and put those in. I'm going to go back to our analytics and say instead of having the traces, we will put in here trace ID as a string, the span ID as a string, and the parent span ID as a string. And then in our envelope, we'll go and fetch those. So let's add the arguments. And this is going to be traces dot span ID. And we need to add traces dot. Oh, first one's going to be trace ID. Better get that right. Span ID and parent span ID. These are still not quite the right type because they are a little data class to hold the value. So we want to get the actual value out of there to make it a string. And finally, the parent span ID may be null. So we want to get the value only if it's not null and that implies that this could be null here. Okay, let's run that. So now looking at our actual, we have trace span and parent span ID at sort of the right level. But we can't just copy this and put it into our test because they will change for every request. So in our test, we'd better have a way of setting them. So let us do that. So the first thing we're going to do is create some Zipkin traces with a trace ID and a span ID. and a parent span ID. And we want to set those 
into the current thread somehow. So we have set for current thread. So that would be zipkin traces dot set for current thread something that we control. And given that we control them, let's put them in. So let's take all this into here. And then instead of these random numbers here, we're going to get the things we put in for the thread. And those are a little suspiciously close to the name, so I'm just going to take the ID off them to check that we're not using literals. Very nearly right. But of course they have to be in the thread before we actually make the event. There. Now, I've been burned with thread locals before. I wonder whether Kotlin context receivers will help us with that problem eventually. One thing I do know is though that setting things in the current thread tends to break things way away from where we see them. So what we'd like to do is remember the old version and have the new version in here and then whatever was there after this test is finished wants to be put back again. And in fact you can see that pattern here in the actual filter that it remembers the old one here and then it finally sets it back again. So let's just go and do that in our test. What we're going to do is we're going to say val old traces is zipkin traces dot with the current thread. And then we're going to do some things after we've set that. We can do some things at the end of which, no matter what, even if there were exceptions, we are going to say reformat and run that. Okay, our test is now full of implementation details, so let's try and extract that into something that we can name. We can do that by pulling this out as a variable and moving that up here. And then taking the body of this and making it into a lambda. What we can do is we can say, this is some sort of function defined by this lambda. And then we're going to invoke that function. We run just this test. We should see that that is doing the same thing. Now we're going to take this lambda out of here, about there, and then this block of code we can make into a function. We'll call it with traces. This is going to be the traces, and this is going to be some function that we're going to invoke in that context. So you can see here, we'll remember the old one, we'll set the new one for the current thread. We'll try to invoke the block, and then we will replace the old traces. Pull that up as a top level utility thing that we might remember we have and use somewhere else. Or at the very least is expressing what we're trying to do here. And that allows us to inline this. then move that out.
something like that. So, we have nothing, then with some set of traces, we're going to fire off analytics event. Which is going to lead to this logging with the trace ID and the span ID that we pulled out of there. So I think that's not a bad test. We will just run everything. And now if we run our application events tests, we can see that the two events for the same request have the same trace ID and if they have the same span ID. So the uncaught exception and the actual response. So what have we done today? Well, we have added request tracing and we have reported every HTTP transaction. So every request and response that we make, we now report. And the request tracing allows us to tie those together so that we can see all of the analytics events that are associated with a single request. And potentially at least the span IDs would allow us to see the relationship between different processes if they were to communicate. I hope you trust me to commit and push to production without your help. And I hope you've enjoyed this. I think next time we're going to look at the relationship between our event system and other errors that we might get in the application. If you want to see that, then please subscribe to this channel. And if you like this content, then I suspect that you will enjoy the book that I wrote with that price called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook, details of which are also in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching.